And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer here to the temple, coming to us straight from Monster Fight Club, creator of... Creator of Tentacle Town, the, the Witcher Miniatures game, and now the upcoming Cyberpunk Red Combat Zone, the one and only John Kovaleski. How are you doing today, man? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm do I'm doing pretty good. It's a it's re the Minnesota weather is playing relatively nice with me for now. I'll just give it about five minutes, then th then things are gonna go back to normal. Ah. <laughs> um. But a bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings. So I'm when it comes to the when it comes to the idea of bo of board gaming or at, not no, not board gaming with uh, miniatures gaming, what was your introduction to it? Uh, I'd say my introduction was back in college, and the um, first miniature I ever had was a Games Workshop High Elf. And I didn't purchase that. I was given that from a friend who bought an army because he wanted me to play along with his stuff to help him play test. And he gave me a bunch of high elves that he got off of either an exchange or a trade or whatever it was it had. But in that box, there was also a um, there was also a painted unit of dark angels. And I was looking at those. I'm like, ooh, what are these guys? They look way cooler to me than these elves. And uh, I ended up playing 40k way more than I played uh, fantasy back in the day. Mm -hmm. Now, when now uh, when it comes to when it comes to co when it comes to Cyberpunk Red Combat Zone, now first first off, were you how familiar were you with um with Cy with Cyberpunk before before taking on this project? Oh, I used to play back in college, and I'm I'm in my fifties now. So <laughs> it's you know, when it first came out, I was I was back playing um, Cyberpunk 2020. Um, I was a big um, Artel Sorian fan back in the day, mm -hmm. um, and I still am today. But um, yeah. yeah, that was that was appealing to me. I think a, a lot of people. I'm not sure where a lot of people get their first, you know, exposure to miniatures. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I used to go to Historicon to probably about 10, 15 years ago. So there was a lot of historical figures that I used to look at. I used to like playing some World War II stuff. Um, I was never a big reenactor that never made a lot of sense to me to uh, put down a battle that I already know how it's going how it's gonna end on the table. That mm -hmm. never made sense to me. I wanted to sit there and do my own thing. Um, I definitely got inspired by um, all the games workshop stuff I played mm -hmm. um, when I was younger. And then um, you know I played you know I played some red box D and d too back when I was really young. Yeah. So uh, you know back, back when it was the evil game. And uh, actually, there's a fun story that uh, when I started playing it, my mom actually went and um, asked asked the priest if it was okay for me to be playing this this game because of all the pre bad press and stuff that was out there. And uh, he's like, you know, it's make believe, right? I'm like, yep. He's like, he's good to go. He was really <laughs> cool. <laughs> and that was the extent of it. Yeah. Um, but that's that. I would say that that's kind of my uh, my early introduction to gaming and. Uh, you know, going back to cyberpunk. Yeah, I was really into all of that. Um, you know, you know, I watched The Matrix. Blade Runner was one of my favorites as a kid. Um, Johnny Mnemonic was was a super fun movie for me. Mm -hmm. um, all of that was, I guess, got into my psyche. And over my 20 plus years in the miniature world of doing stuff, um, in the back of my head, I always knew I was going to end up doing something in this genre. I didn't realize that I would be doing the genre, doing cyberpunk for real, which was very, very cool when I got the opportunity. Yeah. Um, now, since you had mentioned that you had that you had been playing um, cyberpunk in one form or another for for since since its early days, um, I do have to I do have to address the elephant in the in the room and ask: Did you ever did you ever did you ever touch three Because that's the scub one. <laughs> um, you know. I, I really didn't, um, 
basically when I played, and it's like most most RPGs that I play. Mm-hmm. For me, they're reference books. I don't play anything, you know, spot on by the rules as it goes through. As as a, you know, later on a game designer, I would always run into things that I was just like, ah, I think this makes more sense to me. And I was usually DMing things. So, you know, as the god of the game, I got to uh, run it any way I wanted. And if you didn't like it, I'd kill your character or try to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, the mantra around here is the dice gods are merciless. But now, give, now um, given the fact that combat that combat zone is a skir- is a skirmish um, miniatures set miniatures setup. Um, yes. One of the one of the main que- one of the main questions I have is in is in regard to army building because for a lot of people for a lot of people their um their appro- their approach with army building is going is going to be all about the points you know units cost sure. points can I, can, I mean, max it, can I do that sort of thing sure yeah um so when it com- when it comes to when it comes to that sort of management with with building armies. Um, how do you strike a balance between ma- between making sure that each particular faction has enough has enough to go around, but also not, but also one doesn't um, have to have too much to work with? It's this thing called math, <laughs> and we build we build very elaborate spreadsheets, and um, all of the armies are basically generated um, mathematically mm-hmm. as we go through stuff, and then we build the stats first before even knowing what things are being assigned to. Yeah. And then when we have all the stats and we know that, you know, this stat is worth approximately 1.35 of that stat, which is worth, you know, 0.85 of that stat. Once you have those formulas and everything worked out, then it's just a matter of naming, naming the effect and applying it to the appropriate person to go along with the theme and the story. Mm-hmm. Now, Combat Zone ha- is obviously focused on the get on the gangs in Nice City, the the nice the nicest place to live, quote unquote. <laughs> and what I what I'm curious is what I'm curious is to pick your brain on is the is the sort of gameplay styles that you that you designed um you designed each of the gangs to to kind of not necessarily focus on but have a bit of a leaning towards. Sure, and I'd I'd like to start. I'd like to go from top to bottom on that. So I'll start at the top with Maelstrom. Okay, so 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 Maelstrom is more of a um, in your face, smash you with a hammer kind of army, as far as mm-hmm. we're concerned. Um, so there's, if you look at those characters, um, their stats seem to be pumped more into melee effects or short range combat, mm-hmm. or um, there's also um, they have some high hacking abilities. That are built into them too. Mm-hmm. So when we look at a particular faction, um, you know, we go back to the source. And for me, I'm lucky enough to to talk to Mike directly, um, Mike Bonsmith. Mm-hmm. So I just ask him. I'll say, "Say, oh, what should these guys be doing?" And we'll pull out the books. We'll see what every all the canon was in the past, and then we will go back and um, start applying stats to the appropriate places. So we tried really, really hard as we're sitting here building different armies up to make sure that their stats thematically match up with the RPG. All right. Um, next is the Tiger Claws. Gotcha. So the, the Tiger Claws are also about melee. They are also about ha- um, hacking, um, but they're also a, there's there's a lot of influence that they're doing. Um, you know, they, they tend to control the town, not just through money and hacking and that other sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but also just, they seem to own a little piece of everything as they're going through there. So we've tried to incorporate a lot of that into it. Um, hacking is pretty interesting in the game. So when you're sitting down and you have, let's say you have a net runner doing some things, um, as far as the theme and the story goes, um, because, you know, in, in Cyberpunk, there is no global net. Everything is very localized. It's broke down into, into zones. So what we do in, in story-wise is we will sit back and we will set up 
for lack of a better word, we'll call it colored network. So you might have a red network or green network, and these are representing small localized networks that affect different things on the table. So if you have a net runner that is able to hack, let's say the green network that's in there, and you might look around the table and you might see four different um, security cameras that are designated green. That means that they're attached to the green network. So if you can control the green network, then you can control those four cameras. Line of sight is really, really important in this game. Um, line of sight is pretty indefinite because of the size of the table goes. So um, most games are played on a uh, 22 by 30 inch mat. Um, you can also play double that. You can go as large as, as large as you want. There's nothing that says you can't. But most of what we do in, in game terms is we want to be people to be able to play in a tournament setting. So if you're sitting on a, you know, a 60 inch by 30 inch folding table, we wanted to make sure that you could get a, you know, a play session laid out on that table easily. And on smaller game tables, you can get two of them on there. Um, if you're doing like a 40 by 30, that lays really nice on the table that you can lay it down and spread it out and do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, going back to the hacking and line of sight, um, if you can see it, you can shoot it. And if you are a net runner, you might not be able to see it, but you can see it in the camera. So mm -hmm. if you can see it in the camera, then you can shoot it or you can interact with it and do different things to it. Right. And another big part about the, about the, the game is um, the idea of line of sight with other characters and also comms with other characters. Certain characters are all netted into to one another, so they've got comms and they can talk to each other. So if you have a net runner that's plugged into the green network that can see all these things all over the table that everybody else can't see, you can relay that information off to them. And then if they have indirect weapons or whatever they have, they can actually engage these guys at the same time. All right. So next is the bozos. <laughs> the, bo the, bo the bozos are just a bunch of psychos as far as that goes. So um, they're, they're jokesters, they're pranksters. They, they, they're, they're sadists. A um, couple of the fun rules for, for the bozos that are in there is, um, you know, there, there are some rules in there that um, they like, they like playing to the crowd One of the rules is playing to the crowd. So if you have a particular character that's sitting there, you'll have the character that is, you know, let's for lack of a better word, call him a sergeant right now. But so you have a sergeant level bozo who's out on the field, but then he's got all of his um, gonks running around with him. Um, he will do things just to entertain the gonks, mm -hmm. which are, you know, the more gonks around, the more power this guy might have because he's got a bigger audience. So he's, far likely to do a much more outlandish thing to try to make things happen. Um, also to him, failure is hilarious. So if you have a gonk that is trying to throw a grenade and he screws it up and it drops and blows up three of his friends, that's actually a power boost to himself because he's just laughing so hard. He thinks that's amazing. So he's, he's going to roll with that and turn that into something else. So he literally believes in friendly fire. Exactly. Um, Next would be the combat zoners. Yeah, so they're, they're your basic street gang. Um, combat zoner is, you know, think of thinks of groups of people that are that have ganged up together to have a, have the uh, the mutual benefit of survival in the combat zone, which is mm -hmm. a very dangerous place. So these are guys that will get together, and um, I will call the I would call them the generalists. So if you're looking at a particular, you want a, a gang of people that are have a strong leader and can do a little bit of everything, but they're not super great in any one thing, but they can do it all. Mm -hmm. That's a really good place to look. So, you know, part of it too, is you have, you have people that are designated as a particular gang. So we're going to have stat cards for all of the players that, you know, designate, you know, what faction they belong to. But then you also have a faction of ed edge runners, which, um, that's kind of our catch all group for, for mercenaries. Mm -hmm. So if you want to run a particular gang that is weak in one particular stat area, you can hire mercenaries to come in and kind of fill in that backside um, with the understanding that they are a little bit more expensive because it's, it's kind of a rule break. It's not a break in that it breaks the game, but it's a break in that your army wasn't intended to have that much of that stat. And if you want to have it, you have to pay for it. Right. So rather than, rather than putting the rather than putting the points into, you know, 
getting more guys that can benefit from all being part of the same group. You can get some edge runners and add them in there to kind of fill out the rest of the, the stats that you might be lacking in order for those couple of things that might pop up in a scenario base that normally you wouldn't need them. But in this particular case, you, you really do. Mm-hmm. Um, now next is um, Gen Red, which gives me a very Runaways vibe. Um, it, it is. So um, we were uh, we were jokingly when we were putting it together, it's kind of the uh, the Oliver Twist mm-hmm. of of the cyberpunk world. So the idea is, you know, you have, um, you know, one who I'm going to call, and not necessarily a grown up, but you have one alpha that kind of controls all the kids and looks after, looks after the group and mm-hmm. treats them like a family. So it is the quote parent figure that's looking after all the kids. And then all of the kids together work as informants and they can run around, they can run around, see things, report things back. And then as a group, they can go out and do other things. They're, they're very good at getting into networks. They're very good at, um, I would call them makers. They like scrounging for bits, putting together little robots and little drones and having them do different things. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're very good at infiltrating places because generally people look at a kid and they're not worried about it. But these guys, you know, they're not just a kid. They're part of a network. Mm-hmm. And they can do some really fun things together. They're also they're also young and quick. Um, a lot of them you'll see them on skateboards and you know rollerblades and other sort of things. So they tend to have a little bit faster movement than Hit. other people on there. Hit um, runners, yeah, pretty much. So they might not hit as hard, but they can get in and get out before you can even hit them back. Sometimes. All right. So that, so that's kind of a that's kind of a fun thing. So I would say you know. I would say that's a good breakdown of where we're at. And then all of the other ones that we have come in, you know, let's save those for another time. Yeah. Well, there is, there is one that you, um, that you, that you forgot. Um, that's actually the last one I have on my list. Um, lawmen. Um, so, so the, the lawmen are all about being able to take serious sustained damage and fight back against everybody else. So they can concentrate firepower. They've got comms. They work better as a group. So the more lawmen you have in a small contained area, um, the better they tend to do and as a fighting style, as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a command structure. So um, the, the more command you have in a particular area, the better everybody else does. Um, they also, because of the command structure, you could have a commander that goes out and does something then issues an order and then in game terms it's a all the characters have actions when they're Mm -hmm. done with their action control of play goes back over to the other opponent who will do a character use up his actions and go past one of the things the lawmen have is uh is a command structure and that allows them to use a to use an action to have other people do actions so they tend to work you know you don't normally just have the commander doing something. The commander will do something. Then the lieutenant will do something. He'll pass it down to the sergeant who will do something. And then you'll have the, the recruits, which are the gongs of law enforcement. Um, when all of the characters have gone and they've used up their actions, when the reset time comes where they can reset their actions, during that reset phase, mm-hmm. all of the recruits move as a single unit as one time. So is if you have, if it's your character turn and you are moving a single character and your opponent then comes up, he might use a gonk turn, which means he gets to take that unit of lower level guys that only have one action a piece, but he gets to move them all as, as a pack. Mm-hmm. And that's very powerful too when it comes to, they are cheap, they are numerous, they can swarm and do all kinds of cool things in game terms. Um, but, you know, they are... They're very fragile. If yeah. you if you sit there with a shotgun and see three of them and within red of each other and come around a quarter, it's very likely you're going to blast all three of them and take them to the ground. Well, it it's not my, it's not my fault. They fell they fell down a flight of bullets. Exactly. <laughs> so, I want to talk a bit about the reaction system that you're that you're doing because even among miniatures games, I find I find this to be to be certainly um, unorthodox. 
Like with a lot with a lot of miniatures games, ev there's a all roads lead to Rome mentality when it comes to ra when it comes to randomizers. Um, there's always the, there's always one particular die type that get that gets used exclusively. Usually just one, usually just one or two dice. Period. But with the reaction system, you have diff you have different types of die that are being used for diff for different types of um, actions. And I'm curious how th how that ca how that kind of came about, and what you and what you guys were trying to encur trying to encourage with this particular system. So, so the reaction system, and we call it reaction because you're able to take these moments in the middle of someone else's turn, and as you are getting hit by someone, you are able to basically interrupt in and react. To what is happening to you so um a lot of miniature games are out there they might be squad based i take my squad you take your squad i take my squad you take your squad other ones are out there it's like i move all of my guys and then you move all of your guys mm -hmm. in a in a skirmish game you know you tend to be playing somewhere between you know five and ten guys on your particular side and we wanted to have more of a more of a, a micro view of the game. Um, whereas we want to be able to tell stories that every single particular character or model on your side is important. And we want to be able to tell that, that story as you're going through. So in game terms, when you're looking at a particular character, most characters have something when, and I'm going to, I'm going to say they have actions, but these are their starting actions. So this is how they start the game. And then that all goes out the window as soon as the game started. Mm -hmm. So you might have a leader who is fairly strong and he might have three actions and I'll call them green, green, yellow. Um, you might have a mid tier leader and he might have a yellow, yellow for actions. And what do those colors mean? Um, we have, three different kinds of dice in the game. We have yellow dice, we have red dice, and we have green dice. Think of a stoplight as it's going through. Mm -hmm. um, red is tends to be close range, small numbers, small dice, it's a D6. Yellow is mid range, um, that is a D8. Notice it's a bigger, date, bigger dice than the D6. Mm -hmm. And then green is fully healthy, energized, ready to go, do other things, and that is a D12. Um, for movement wise, we also have something that we call the limiter, which is essentially a ruler that is broken up into three zones. And those zones represent distance. How far can your model move? So if you have a model that has a red action available, he can move red, which is approximately three inches on the ruler. So mm -hmm. all you got to do is put down this little ruler. It's designated out. You don't need to worry about the actual length of things other than as long as you can move inside the red zone, do it, put it down, move your red. It is what it is. If you have a green action available and you want to spend that green action on movement, simply lay your ruler on the table. It's flexible. So you can bend around corners and do different things. And you can run your guys right up to the length of the ruler, which is about a foot as you go through and do stuff. So if you go back to that, let's take that mid tier guy that's there. Mm -hmm. Um, which I was calling yellow, yellow, but let's make them green, yellow. So I can explain some other rules mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, he can look at his character says, okay, I have two tokens next to this character. It's a green token and a yellow token. Those are my actions. If I want to move, so I'm standing by a corner. I want to move around a corner. And let's say that movement is going to take me about four or five inches. And I know yellow moves about seven inches. So I'm just simply going to take that yellow and spend it, which I'm, you know, in Magic the Gathering terms, I'm creating some energy like mana that's mm -hmm. there that I can spend on something. So I'm going to spend that yellow currency on movement. So I flip over my yellow action. I take my ruler, drop it down. I can move my guy up to the length of the yellow. So I take my guys on a corner. I come around the corner and I look down the street. Mm -hmm. Now I'm looking down the street. I still have a green action still available. Now, if I see, look down the street and I saw a whole bunch of baddies and I'm like, Ooh, this is a bad place to be. I don't want to get shot at by four or five guys. Mm -hmm. I might spend that other green action to run, to run all the way across the street and get behind the building on the other side. So I'm out of line of sight. 
All I would do for that is take the green, flip it over, generate the green currency, for lack of a better word, and spend it on my green movement move. And now that character has no more energy available. So that character's turn is done and control of the turn would pass over to my opponent to do something. So now let's back up once. Hmm. Let's say my guy moves his yellow, looks around the corner, looks down the street, and let's say it's all the way across the board, and there is a car between me and that guy down at the road, but when I get down at eye level and I look, I can clearly see the guy behind the car. So at this point, I'm like, great, I'm now going to take a shot at that guy. My particular leader maybe has the ability to do plus two better on ranged attacks. Ranged attacks is one of the skills that it's possible for a character to have. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has a base stat of the six different stats that are out there. So anybody can shoot a rifle, anybody can shoot a pistol, anybody can try to hack a terminal, but some people are better at it than mm -hmm. others. So this particular guy is better at rifle shooting maybe than other people are. So he's gonna look around the corner as long as he can see that guy down there, all he has to do is say, all right, I'm going to shoot with a green dice. So he is going to flip over that green to generate his green power. He's going to pick up the green dice. and So he's spending the power on the dice. He's rolling that. And let's say he rolls a nine. So he takes a shot, rolls a nine, looks at his range skill, which is going to give him a plus two. He's going to add it. He got 11. He is done. Mm -hmm. He has done everything that he can do right now. And in space you know in time that bullet is now traveling down range and his turn is essentially done but the bullet isn't done if if you think about it for what's going on in game terms mm -hmm. so this bullet travels down and the defender it's now control on the other side he's going to look back and says okay i've got this bullet coming down at me and he is going to look at his card and let's say he has a Let's call him also a green yellow. Mm -hmm. And his yellow, though, is already flipped over. So he's already used one of his actions on that card. So he only has a green action available left. So he is going to say, all right, um, I'm going to take my, my green action. Now, he's not actually spending the action. All he has to do is have a color available as it's going down. So he has a, a yellow color available. Even though it might be used, that token is still on the guy. So he can roll either a yellow or a green dice to defend. And when he's defending, what you are defending against is if you get hit. So you're going to take your dice. You're going to roll the color dice that you want to roll against your opponent. And you are going to add, if you have armor, you're going to add it. So let's say he has a piece of gear that gives him a plus one armor. So mm -hmm. he, let's say he decides he's going to take his green dice and roll it. So he's going to take the green dice, he's going to roll it, and he gets, let's say he gets a five. He's going to take his plus one armor and add it, so he gets a six. And anything between him and the guy shooting him also becomes cover. So he's going to add a plus one for the car as well. So in this case, he has a seven. The guy who shot at him shot with a, I think we said it was a 10, or whatever mm -hmm. the number was. Yeah. Um, and whoever's number is higher wins the roll. Mm -hmm. If it's a tie, it goes to the defender. And a crit always wins. All right. The crit always wins is really important. So in this case, he got down, he shot, and he failed his save. What happens when you fail your save is that the colored dice that you rolled, that token that you basically wagered mm -hmm. against the shot, now it becomes red. When it gets hit, it becomes red. So that D12 dice that you had available to you to do something with is now a D6. So that green token goes off your table and you replace it with a red token. Now, because it wasn't your turn, you didn't have to spend that action, but you basically gambled the green dice against your roll because you wanted to have a better probability of making it. So now you got hit. And because now you have been shot, as it went through, you can now react. So before you had the ability of a green action that was available to do something with, but now you only have a red action that's available to do something with, because we said the yellow action was already spent. So now he can decide to take that red dice and fire back. Or in this case, he sees he's three, three inches away from a corner of a building. He might now 
bend that red action to get out of the way mm-hmm. and run around the corner. So he was able to basically do this matrix moment in the in the middle of a gunfight and react to it and spend an action that he had available to go around the corner. Um, so that's I've I've had people ask me, is, is there like an overwatch system in the game or something like that? Um, not really. But if you don't have available actions, then you can't react when you are shot. Yeah. So there are situations where you will do things to get people to use up their actions. You're almost messing with them. So they're using actions to move around and do things. But then when they're out of actions, that's when you run around and hit them with a grenade because they're not going to be able to react and get out of the way because they've already spent that action. Mm-hmm. So the other thing that's interesting about the dice mechanics that go through is that in this case where we shot, let's say that all he had available was a red dice. There is no way that a D6 is going to add up to be 10 on a, on a on the, on the green roll that we did before. But in the reaction system and the way the dice are set up, remember we said the crits always win. So you can, sometimes it's better to take a much smaller dice when all odds are against you and there's no way I'm gonna be able to get out of the situation. There's always a chance to roll a six. And you're gonna roll that dice and if you win it, you succeeded. Mm-hmm. And that creates some really interesting things in gameplay. Um, most games, as you're playing them, they're fun and you're going through everything else. But in my mind, a really good game is something that you can look at. You remember that game you know, a year later. Remember that time when you came around the corner and you had these three guys and mm-hmm. put all these bullets and I rolled and I rolled two sixes and I got out of it. You know, yeah. those are the me- those are the memories that you remember, mm-hmm. and that's what I think makes the reaction system and um, Cyberpunk Red Combat Zone a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's funny you bring up the Overwatch thing because what I'm re- what I'm reminded of with this ki- with this kind of approach is a slightly riskier version of the reaction system that's in Infinity. Um. And I say slightly riskier because even when even when doing those re, even when doing those reactions, it's not a it's not a guarantee. Whereas in fi- in Infinity, um, it is. And truth be told, comparing this to Infinity isn't exactly fair on my part because one is a full on war game, and the other and the other one is a skirmish game. Yep, yeah, and 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 in all honestly, I tend not to even. I play my games. Mm-hmm. So um, I've never played Infinity. Yeah. I've never read the rule book. I couldn't tell you. We've had other people that have made similar comparisons. I think a lot of the comparisons are just that they're all painted neon colors. Um, I think the rule set itself is very different. I think the I think making those comparisons is an, is inevitable be, just because of how how people how people operate. Um. Now, one in. One um, interesting thing that I'm that I'm curious about with the with the system that you have is the creation of the limiter. Was given the there's a lot of emphasis on green, yellow, red in the mechanics. Was the limiter just a meant to be an extension of that and also to um, streamline range? Well, it was meant to streamline range, but it was the whole thing was meant to streamline gameplay. I didn't want people to have a lot of charts and tables and stuff that they had to look things up and worry about a particular stat and everything else. I wanted everything that they needed to play the game mm-hmm. to be laid out in front of them. I, in, in game terms, a lot of stuff, um, I kind of live with a rule of three. I don't like people to have to track more than three things at any one time. I don't like people to have to make more than, you know, look at three things to make a decision at any one time. I think once you start doing that, um, games start to get stretched out. You know, games where you're sitting there digging through a graveyard of cards, someone might spend four or five minutes in game terms that are in real real time, and it really bogs things down as you're going through stuff. I wanted someone to be able to sit down, and once you get your head wrapped around the rules and how they work, um, it, it's a really fast place thing. You don't need to take a measuring tape out and measure five inches. It's like, now keep it in the color band. Um, you don't have to think about, oh, do I want to do a D8? Do I don't want to do a D6? Do I want to do whatever I happen to be? Now just just pick the color that you're spending. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's a lot cleaner. It's a lot simpler. 30 some odd years ago, um, I was using a version of this for Plastic Army Men. 
you know, little skirmish game that I put together. And it's one of those things that you, you work on, you put it on the shelf and it always kind of bounces around in your head. Mm -hmm. And then when the opportunity came out to kind of, okay, I have exactly what I want for this. And you pull it out and try to make it adapt to what you're doing. And if it can adapt and it's still clean and it's still fast and it's thematic, then I'm all for it. Yeah. And, and what I really like about the system is that it's, it's super adaptable. Mm -hmm. If you, if you want to make a card that represents a cow walking across a field, the math works. If you want to make a tank, the math works. If you want to call a card, a full unit of five guys and just say, no, all five of those guys are represented by one card. It still works. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to end up doing a, a lot of really fun things with this general rule set that we created. Yeah. Now I do want to, I do want to give my congratulations for how, for how much you managed to raise for, um, on the Kickstarter, managing to get just a little over three hundred thousand. Um, but one one thing that I one thing that I had seen on the page that I find interesting is you're you guys are planning on doing a adaptation on Tabletop Simulator. Um, yes. I realize that these kind of things are in flux, but what would you what would you say what would you say is the release date you're kind of shooting for when it comes to that? So, so, I mean, that's, we'd say, I'd say the tabletop simulator is about 90% done right now. Mm -hmm. As we're going through, we are, it's mostly updating stat cards and stuff like that. So the final graphics and stuff are being done. We have a working version of it right now that we've messed around with and it's good. And I would say that by the time the pledge manager comes out, you know, if it's not available the day the pledge manager comes out, it's going to be available very shortly after. All right. And um, so, okay. um, so unfortunately, I'm going to have to start wrapping it up here. All right. With with all that I do, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoying the enjoying the bit of fun, bit of fun that happens here. No, it's my pleasure, and I wish I had more time to do it. It's um, you know, we're a small studio. Mm -hmm. We have you know, we have nine people locally and three more remotely. So mm -hmm. I mean, we're a total of twelve guys. It's yeah. it's not that many people to do the amount of work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, we tend to put in a lot of hours, but we have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, it. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Sounds like fun. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, looking forward to next time. All right. Stay frosty, my friend. All right. Take care. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone for take the, taking their time in the temple. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!